Three ideas in A Christmas Carol which are going to help you get the top grades. I'm going to try and do it without a single edit just to show you how easy these ideas are to apply. Number one, we have the idea of fatherhood. This is why it's so important to the ghost of Christmas past to take Scrooge back to his childhood to show the reader that your upbringing determines your later life. Scrooge is trapped as an isolated and lonely child at school and he replicates that, he reproduces it in his later life. We can see all his later life up until the ghosts appearing as being a recreation of his childhood isolation. Every time he gets close to Fezziwig, to Fan, to Marley, he always picks people who are going to die and disappear. He is going to be abandoned in life and eventually he seeks out that abandonment, ruining his relationship with Belle. But the end of the novel returns us to the idea of fatherhood and Dickens deliberately says that he became a new father to Tiny Tim. So what's the turning point in the novel that leads to that transformation of being the fatherless child who's abandoned by his own father, who then abandons relationships with other people in his adult life, to deliberately choosing relationships and in particular becoming a father? Well, there are two moments. The ghost of Christmas past takes him back to a moment where Belle is with her husband, but more particularly with her daughter, who is about 16 at the time. And Scrooge focuses not on Belle, he focuses on the daughter, the daughter who could have eased the autumn of his years. It's becoming a father that he realised is what's missing in his life. Then the ghost of Christmas present takes him to see the Cratchit family Christmas and he sees Tiny Tim. So the transformation is when he asks that ghost, is Tiny Tim going to survive? And the ghost says, no. This is extraordinary, isn't it? Because this is the ghost of Christmas present. It's the middle of the novel, but that's the moment when he changes. Scrooge is often seen as changing when he gets to the ghost of Christmas future, who, uh, or of things yet to come, who shows him his grave and he shows him people being disrespectful of his dead body. And it's the memento mori idea, this fear of death that makes him change. But I don't think that's the right reading of the novel. His change happens when he realises that he has the responsibility of a father when he is an employer and he can become that second father to Tiny Tim, which is why the novel ends as it does. Okay, so I've got the theme of fatherhood that takes me from the beginning to the end. Whenever I go from beginning to end, I'm always offering at least a thoughtful response and probably a convincing and conceptualised one. That's why it shoves me up into the top grades. Right, our next theme, ignorance and want. If you think about the events of the novel, if ignorance and want don't appear, the whole novel is exactly the same. Scrooge transforms exactly the same. The power of Christmas is reinforced exactly the same. The power of charity, love of your fellow man, all that stuff still stands. And so Dickens introduces them for another reason. Interestingly, Every other novel Dickens wrote, except this one, he kind of got paid by the word because he serialised them. So he had to get to X number of thousand words by the end of the week, bosh, publish that, and I get paid. Well, this was different. He wrote this in only about four weeks, and he did it all in one go, then published it as a complete book. So any extra words are lost income. He's got to pay for the printing. Any extra words are redundant. So he puts these characters in deliberately. Why? Because he is obsessed with two things. Number one, poverty and revolution. Number two, education and revolution. 
Let me explain. So just before he wrote this book, he had this idea of writing a political pamphlet about the problems of childhood education, childhood poverty, and children being made to work. Luckily for us, he was strapped for cash and he needed to make some quick money. So this is around November time and he thinks, right, okay, people spend a lot of Christmas, I'm gonna write a Christmas book. Yeah, so he writes this book primarily just to make money, but he also wants to deliver this political message about poverty and education. And so he puts that into the book. This is where ignorance and want come in. So he introduces the idea of poverty as a danger to society. You'll be familiar with the Malthusian idea that the poor are a burden on society because they eat up resources. And so, you know, that's all the conversation he has about um, the poor rather dying than go to the workhouse. Well, fine, let them go and do it then. That's what all that's about. But Dickens takes a different perspective. He says, look, if we create a society which is poor, they're not just going to use up resources that we need, they're actually going to rise up against us. And this is what happens only five years later across Europe in 1848. There are revolutions all over the place. Europe had already seen a massive revolution in France with all the aristocracy being executed. And this idea that revolution would come to Britain was something that he was really, really interested in. Now, want, poverty, is not the worst of the two. It is ignorance that's the worst of the two. That's the boy with doom written across his head. And the point here, Dickens is saying, is look, if you educate the poor, then they will be able to get jobs and earn money and stop being poor. And in that way, society will improve. But if you don't educate the poor, then what other recourse will they have except violence? Well, actually very little. You know, if jobs aren't paying them enough and they're not educated enough to get better jobs, then they're obviously going to turn to crime and violence to make ends meet, to survive. And so this is a plea for educating the poor. That, of course, is a big deal in the 1800s where literacy levels are rising dramatically and also Dickens' livelihood depends on that, doesn't it? The more people who can read, the more people who buy his books, the better off he'll be. But it's not just self-interest. He wants to change society for the better by educating everyone to make them literate. Now, this is particularly relevant to him and it brings us back also conveniently to the idea of fatherhood. So, when Dickens was 12, his father was arrested for having too many debts. And the way the prison system worked then is that you were sent to jail, not as a punishment um, for a crime that you've committed, you were sent there until you could pay off those debts. And how did that work? Well, his family had to move in with him, yeah? So Dickens' brothers and sisters and his mum had to move into this debtor's jail with his dad, but not Dickens. Because Dickens was 12 years old, he was now old enough to work, and he was sent away to work in a tanning factory, hard labour with disgusting tar and working with leather, disgusting conditions, and he wasn't allowed to live with the family, he had to take lodgings. So he basically earned the money to pay off his father's debts. Obviously, he didn't pay them all off. There are other sources of income. But he was sent to work because of the father that he had. And he was snatched away from his family, snatched out of school and forced to work in these disgusting conditions in order to pay his father's debts. So Dickens has got daddy issues. At the time that he's writing in 1843, his dad is coming back to his famous author son and asking for money. So the idea of fatherhood and poverty are completely linked in Dickens' mind. And Dickens has also, in his own mind, raised himself up out of poverty by refusing to stay in these factory conditions. He got himself an education and he became a court reporter and then a writer. Education saved Charles Dickens, and he wants education to save all the other kids like him who are 
everywhere in society because they don't have a school system as we've got. He's campaigning to get a school system that will educate the population so that they can enjoy success as he has. Another little nuggety detail here is that the Cratchits family home in Camden Town is the family home that Charles Dickens was in when he was dragged out of it and his family were dragged out of it because of his father's um, debt. So it's actually the same house which he describes in the same place. He deliberately places his own house in the novel because psychologically that is what he's writing about, his own journey into poverty and then out of it through education. That's why ignorance and want appear in the novel. You probably haven't been taught that, which is a guarantee that writing about this is going to distinguish your writing from hundreds of thousands of other um, students in the exam and you're gonna get the grade that you want. Which brings us to number three. It's very easy to see the themes of a Christmas Carol as charity, Christmas, love, respect for your fellow man, all these things that easily trip off the tongue. But what's often not considered is the role of the employer. So let's consider that role. Scrooge is an employer. And the key thing that begins and ends the novel is his role as an employer. At the beginning, remember, he's only using one bit of coal. Poor old Bob Cratchit has to work Christmas Eve. And then Scrooge complains that, oh, I suppose you want me to pay for your Christmas day, do you? Oh, taking all my money, you sleaze. So that's his role as an employer there. Then we get to the end and he gets Bob Cratchit and says, I'm going to increase your wages. So Dickens is obsessed with Scrooge's, not just his generosity, but his role as an employer. Then we have Fezziwig introduced, who we find out made everybody's lives happy, not by spending loads of money on them, but by giving them care and love and a sense of family while they worked for him. That's the point of the Fezziwig Christmas party. So Scrooge has seen what a good employer looks like. Guess what? It looks a lot like a good father. That's the kind of figure that Fezziwig and his wife represent, husband and wife, father and mother team, to their apprentices. When we get to the end, Scrooge, as we've seen, also becomes a better father at the same time as becoming a better employer. Why? Because Shakespeare, that's not Shakespeare, Dickens wants to show us that being a better employer is like being a better father. Let's dig even deeper to some more characters who nobody writes about. They are the charwoman, the laundress, the undertaker's man, and Joe, the receiver of stolen goods. So let's start with Joe. He is described as about 70, and he's living in this hovel where the door into what he calls his parlour, his best room, is actually a ragged curtain. He clearly lives in poverty, and he's still having to fence stolen goods at the age of 70. Dickens' message, crime does not pay. It's not a moral message, it's a financial message. These are poor people who are trying to make ends meet and even turning to crime isn't enough. Now, let's consider the charwoman and the laundress and the undertaker's man. These are people with jobs who are paid so little by the employers that they have to go out and steal just to get a proper income. This is Dickens' very clever message. He's telling his readers that middle class and wealthy Victorians are employing loads of people in the course of their day. You know, they don't have washing machines, they have a washing machine. Uh, they have a washerwoman. They don't have um, ways of cleaning the house because, you know, the wife doesn't want to do that. They get a charwoman to come in and clean the house for them. There are loads and loads of these jobs grocery delivery people, milkmen, who depend on the wages that people pay. Dickens' point is, you don't pay enough, dear reader. 
we as a society don't pay enough, so the poor stay poor, and in order to make ends meet, loads of them will naturally turn to crime. And that's why when Scrooge goes to visit them, negotiating how much money they'll get for stuff they've stolen off him, they behave in really polite ways. They're really careful of what they say to each other. They don't want to hurt each other's feelings. No, you go first. No, you get the best price. They are nice people doing horrible things because they have been kept poor. Which brings us to the obsession with Bob Cratchit and him being paid 15 bob, 15 shillings. Dickens is making a really profound point. Scrooge, who is this awful miser we're supposed to hate through a lot of the novel, even though there's a lot of humour, so we enjoy his company, but we're supposed to hugely disapprove of him, even though he's this terrible um, hate figure, he's actually paying Bob the going wage. That is... Dickens' final joke. This horrible miser who we've spent most of the novel disapproving of is paying exactly the same as all the other employers. Bob doesn't just walk off and do another job, does he? Which is what you and I would do and what Bob would have done in the real Victorian period. The reason he doesn't do that is he's not going to get a better deal anywhere else. He's got a secure job with Scrooge on a fair wage. Of course, Dickens' point is, that's completely unfair. It's just deemed fair by society because those with money exploit those without. And that is why it's so important at the end of the stave five that Dickens makes sure Scrooge raises the wages for Bob Cratchit. Three topics that other people won't be writing about that will give you grade seven if you do it badly grade eight and nine if you do it well. You'll notice that I've not really introduced any quotes. That's not just because I want to do this in one take. It's because you don't actually need to quote. You just have to refer to incidents and what is said. The examiners will give you the marks for it. Replay the video, see how I did it, whap it in your essay. It's not plagiarism. Good luck. If you want to see a grade nine essay on an inspector calls or Macbeth, what am I doing? Damn it, I wish I could have edited this video. There's going to be a grade nine essay that I think you should watch right now.